This is the story of a man and a brook, and an unusual legacy, passed on through four generations of Lymans to the American public. My name is Charles Lyman, and there must be few people in modern America who can look at a personal landscape, a brook, a marsh, a cottage, and realize that it has little changed from the view that pleased his great-grandfather in 1860. That is Red Brook for me. I have used Theodore Lyman's fly rod and his axe. His ancient sweater and mittens, still here in the cottage he built, have warmed me after a wet day. This is a story of Theodore Lyman and the Red Brook. Here is the mouth of Red Brook. It runs into Buttermilk Bay, which connects with Great Buzzards Bay, which opens to the North Atlantic Ocean at the root of Old Cape Cod. In 1870, as population growth and the Industrial Revolution began to threaten America's natural waterways, Theodore Lyman conceived of preserving this Red Brook by buying the land on either side of it from source to mouth. It stayed in the family for 150 years, with the result that it looks much the same as it did before the American Civil War. Beginning in 1990, after four generations of studied preservation, the Lymans gave the Red Brook and 638 acres of land around it to a consortium of state and private conservation groups as a permanent legacy to the American people. This action has preserved a wild and beautiful watershed from the aggressive development of vacation homes and strip malls which surround it. It has also promoted the constant study of and active intervention in the decline of fish and wildlife in Massachusetts and the East Coast generally, which Theodore Lyman, a pioneering scientist and naturalist, first noted in the 1870s. In that sense, this brook has always been a beautiful and cherished laboratory. There's such a sense of history here, and it's multifaceted history. It's not just the history, it's the history of a family, and, and of a family going through time and multi-generations. There's a history of, of, of the land itself and the changes in the land. There's a history of their interest in making improvements on a fishery that they really loved, and there's almost a blueprint of the various things that they did and the things that we're still doing. Warren Winders was involved with Red Brook long before 2003, when he became Trout Unlimited's director of operations at Red Brook. I think the thing that impressed me about about your father and your uncle. I often thought to myself, now, here are two men who were able to fish any place they wanted to in the, in the world and have done some of the great fishing in the world. Fish Scotland for salmon and Iceland and giant bluefin tuna. And yet it was obvious that one of their favorite places to fish was Red Brook. Uh, probably their favorite place to fish. <laughs> With the deaths of my father and my uncle Henry, the third generation is gone now. As for myself, I've been coming here since I was born, and it's a shock to see old paths and landmarks hand-built and initialed by beloved family members being demolished and hauled away. But after four generations of loving care of this brook, of stocking salmonid fish from brown trout to Canadian salmon, of creating breeding ponds and fishing holes, 
and after clearing out predators by shocking and capturing them, the fishing has continued to decline. It is obvious now that stocking the brook with alien species has not worked, and that in fact, the brook itself knows best. So the ancient dams, fishing holes, and cranberry bogs are being cleaned out as the brook is returned to its original state. All of this is essential to allowing the species natural to the brook to again thrive without restocking year in and year out. But study and change has always been a vital concern for the scientists of the Lyman family. This is but a new chapter in that story, the story of Red Brook. It will be closely observed by experts in Massachusetts and beyond. Thus, while this film is about the Lyman family's stewardship of Red Brook, it is also about the evolution of conservancy itself. Theodore Lyman, the third of that name, was born in 1833. His father was mayor of Boston and died early. At the age of 16, Theodore III inherited the fortune his grandfather, Theodore, had made with clipper ships in the China trade. He also inherited a lifestyle based on the old English idea of an estate. He was born at the Vale in Waltham, Massachusetts, one of the first estates in colonial America. There the families of Theodore I and II had lived since 1798 with a degree of comfort and tasteful elegance appropriate to what they might have called their social station. The Vale was also an experimental farm, early to adopt selective animal breeding, with perhaps the first greenhouse in the country. It also employed a great brick wall, specifically oriented to catch the winter sun and warm the peach trees near it. When Theodore III was still a child, his family moved from the Vale to a 60-acre estate in Brookline called Singletree. The new house was designed in the fashionable Italian villa style by the leading architect of the day, Richard Upjohn. Experimental agriculture continued, along with the family's founding memberships in the Massachusetts Horticultural Society and the Society for Promoting Agriculture. Theodore graduated fourth in his class from Harvard University in 1855. He did his postgraduate work with Louis Agassiz, brilliant scholar and naturalist, and the founder of Harvard's Museum of Comparative Zoology. Theodore was an urban man, formal in dress, and centered in Boston. Yet he loved to escape the city, to wander the woods and fish the waters of Old Cape Cod. He would often take the train to Wareham, a sleepy town of farmers and fishermen on the shores of Buzzards Bay. Nearby, he discovered Red Brook, an ancient resource to the Indians, thick with trout and herring and clams and quahogs in the mudflats. The Indians left 14-foot shell heaps as evidence of their enjoyment. The brook was a boundary between tribes and later between pilgrim townships. When the first white settlers from old Europe arrived, they settled nearby at Plymouth Plantation and they came to Red Brook to hunt and fish. It seemed like there was enough for all. Later settlers cleared the forests and watered their cattle beside the brook. In its marshy crooks grew wild cranberries, a tart and delicious fruit justly celebrated by the Indians for its medicinal properties. In the 1840s, the growing nation developed a taste for the cranberry, and it became a major cash crop for Cape Cod. But cranberries love water. Water also aids in harvesting. Building square bogs with dikes and flooding them at harvest time with water from a nearby stream became the solution of choice. So dams and weirs and bogs were installed at Red Brook. Yet the demand for water at the brook's headwaters, followed months later by the release of pent water from the bogs, 
gave the brook an artificial cycle of drought and spate. As the Industrial Revolution, already driving Boston and Providence, arrived in Wareham, pollution from both waste and fertilizer took its toll. This was the brook Theodore found, and eventually saw threatened. For the most part, he was able to stop the process, but his vision was to protect the brook through time. His strategy was to purchase as much land as possible, to create a passion for conservation values in his family, and then leave the continuing use and care of the brook to the next generation. By his death, Red Brook was the cherished domain of his sons and his widow. But as all who came after knew, it was Theodore's brook. It was here that he could relax. He kept a daily journal most of his life, and on August 23, 1863, it reads, Took a train to Red Brook. This pretty brook runs into one of the estuaries beyond or above Cohasset Narrows. It is noted for sea trout and is preserved. My 30th birthday, under the circumstances, the future ones are somewhat in doubt. He had decided to join the Union Army and the Civil War. As I walked about this beautiful old place with the clear air and the fine breeze, the idea of going to war struck me with a tenfold disagreeable contrast. But what is the use? A man must march when it is his plain duty, and all the more if he has had, in this world, more than his share of cake. Theodore Lyman was saying goodbye to the sweet things of life his wife and daughter and home, the wild natural world of old Cape Cod where he loved to walk and fish, to struggle with blood and death in the Civil War. I have cleared my three times ten years, and it is quite time that I did something for somebody. He left behind a trout brook, a clear, cold stream which flowed through the woods and marshes to Buttermilk Bay, and through his mind as he endured the war. He carried with him the image of the swirl and dapple of a brook trout, an image vivid to him in war and peace and to his descendants after him. He joined the headquarters of his old friend, General George Gordon Meade, commanding the Union Army of the Potomac, who two months earlier had won a great victory over Lee's Army of Northern Virginia at Gettysburg. Lyman joined the Army of the Potomac at Warrington Junction. His letters home to Mimi are a vivid portrait of the war from Gettysburg to the end. His acute observations on troops, movements, battles, and death are mixed with thoughts on the natural world he fought over. Appomattox. We are pelting after old Lee as hard as the poor doughboy's legs can go. I estimate our prisoners at 16,000. Lots of guns and colors. There is no rest for the wicked. The six corps charges, they can't be stopped. The result, five rebel generals, 8,600 prisoners, rebel rear guard annihilated. General Meade selected Lyman and one other aide to accompany him to Appomattox Courthouse for the surrender. As General Meade introduced we two aides, Lee put out his hand and saluted us with all the air of the oldest blood in the world. I did not think when I left for the front in 63 that I should ever shake the hand of Robert E. Lee, prisoner of war. We left Lee and kept on through the sad remnants of an army that has its place in history. My little share of this work is done. God willing, before many weeks or even days, I shall be at home to campaign no more.
Theodore Lyman returned to Singletree, the estate left to him by his father in Brookline, Massachusetts. While there, he led the life of a gentleman in stiff collar and cravat. But he loved to retreat to the relative wilds of Cape Cod, a short train ride away, and sought the unbuttoned company of a remarkable businessman and fisherman, Samuel Tisdale of Wareham. Tisdale had a home in New York, but preferred the Cape. October 28, 1867. Off, early, for Agawam, East Wareham, to see S.J. Tisdale. He introduced fish into Flax Pond and many other places. His house, a great curiosity, low rooms and old-fashioned, with L's and wood houses and sheds stuck on here and there. In 1866, Theodore Lyman's deep interest in fishing and natural resources resulted in his becoming a commissioner of fisheries for the state of Massachusetts. The purpose of this commission was to encourage the cultivation of useful fishes and to counter the steep decline in natural fishing. Theodore toured the state, inspecting ponds and spillways, encouraging hatcheries, and setting up game laws. November 10. I am scratching away at my fishway report, which is slow work to digest rightly. Thermometer, 28 degrees, 9.30 a.m. August 2, 1865. Despite shaking of the doctor's head, started for town to go to the Cape, if well enough. I was wondrously helped by this air, which indeed is a charm to me, this southerly sea air, gently bracing and steadily blowing day and night, a remarkable feature. Was glad to find little Coco waiting for me at the Russells. She was as pink as a rosebud and fell fast asleep in the carriage coming out. Theodore also continued his work with the naturalist Louis Agassiz who was raising support for the Museum of Comparative Zoology at Harvard University. This was a time of revolutionary change in the natural sciences. In England, Charles Darwin had published On the Origin of Species in 1859. Scientists around the world struggled to prove or disprove the theories of natural selection. It was Agassiz's concept to collect multiple examples of all possible species under one roof where they could be studied and compared. Theodore became chief fundraiser and treasurer for this enormous undertaking. He was also an overseer for Harvard University. Scientists, including Louis Agassiz, his son Alex, and Theodore Lyman himself, contributed species collected from around the world. Began today to go out to the museum to help unpack the Brazil collections of Agassiz. Already there are 160 kegs and barrels. Alex and I went at them, in jars and fresh kegs, and putting in new whiskey. It makes one's hands rather flavorsome. Still today, amongst the vast collection of the ichthology department of the museum, are trout collected from Red Brook in the 1860s. It turns out that whiskey is an excellent preservative because it does not destroy the DNA of the animal. PM train for Wareham, and found Professors Agassiz and Wyman waiting to accompany, for I am to take them to Tisdale's to recruit and look into shell heaps, etc. We dug diligently for hours. The heaps that crown the headlands are about two to four feet thick. The heaps are mainly of mud, clam, and oyster shells, with fragments of various mammal bones. I rode home wet to the waist, but with a roaring appetite and a fund of health. During these efforts, the great war America had passed through was never far from his mind. He became a board member on the committee to erect Harvard's Memorial Hall in memory of his fallen classmates. Their names are pleasant to think on, and it seems as if they were in the old room there. What we have since gone through seemed like something distant, unreal, almost confused, and yet very vivid to the memory. These Harvard men, my contemporaries or successors, lying shot on the field of battle, almost boys, some of them, it seems as if surely they ought to come back alive and well to the college yard 
They were too good and too young to die. Work on the Museum of Comparative Zoology continued. The second volume of the catalog of the Museum of Comparative Zoology was out today. It is near 250 pages with a great number of line woodcuts on black background, excellently executed. May 11, 1868. Took home a trout Mr. Tisdale had got at Red Brook. A delightful day. This kind of life is perfection. Too perfect for it makes me snappish to return to humdrum committee this and committee that. When I do leave my own fireside, I choose the Cape Cod air above all others. Then solitude, not many people. Woods, ponds, a bit of the sea making up here and there. Something homely and old fashioned about the house and only men in the party. Tisdale is easy and charming. He built a tank to observe the habits of trout that he caught, to fatten and breed them. By January of 1870, Theodore Lyman had made up his mind to preserve Red Brook by buying the land along its edges from an assortment of farmers and cranberry growers, from its source to its mouth on Buttermilk Bay. It is to be $1,200 for house and marsh and land. Packard is after the upper land now for me. He had witnessed the brook changing from a relatively wild state to a resource stressed by a growing population, more fishermen, and by periodic runoff from cranberry bogs. Change was coming, and he was inventing what would now be called a green conservation plan to meet it. His intention was not simply to control and preserve hunting and fishing on the model of European rivers, but to experiment with growing and stocking fish and creating fish habitat. This he would do with dams, weirs, and holes, and by clearing the brook of brush and fallen timber. July 25, 1869. After breeders once more to Red Brook, we went in at the Smith Place, a mile below Bartlett's Marsh, and worked down to the Eye Stone, two miles or more. The Eye Stone is a huge boulder, big as a small house, and standing close to the brook. A tougher time could not be. We were nine strong hours going that distance. Such a tough and a thicket with ancient fallen logs and bushes that interlace boughs across the brook. Some parts seemed unchanged since Puritan days. He created a pond in which he put fish he caught to grow fat, breed, and restock the brook. April 29th, 1869. All hands to the hatching house, where we found the fish healthy, but growing very little. Therefore, ordered liver and hard egg, given freely. He made careful notations of temperature and weather. March 21, 1871. Air, 51 degrees. Half a gale from the southeast with violent rain. Fish from Bartlett's Marsh Dam to Smith's Place. Took 12 fish, and Bob caught three in his net four to nine ounces. The brook and marsh came with a small farmhouse, which Theodore set about repairing and converting, the front to his hunting lodge, the back to accommodate a caretaker. Bob Holmes was hired to maintain the brook, to look out for poachers and take care of trout breeding. May 31, 1870. Ran down to Red Brook and found Bob there established in his end of the house. The hole has been papered and painted and looks very neat. Below, I have a sitting room and a small bedroom. Above, a good bedroom and a rough bedroom and a large closet for my rods and other closets for china, etc. I have a dinner set and, in fact, a complete outfit on a modest scale. Mimi and their eight-year-old daughter, Cora, were frequent visitors to the Cape, but they had no idea that Red Brook had been bought. Mimi knows nothing of my having bought Red Brook after mystifying her with all the new spoons, etc., I told her, and she was much pleased. Theodore experimented vigorously with lessons learned as fish commissioner, 
by continuing to insert foreign species in the brook. R.R. Holmes put 3,000 crawfish from west into Red Brook. About this date, Holmes put 5,000 salmon in Red Brook. About this date, Robert R. These Holmes restocking experiments were successful only for a year or two. The foreign fish never caught on. In fact, science in the 21st century has concluded that salter trout, in particular, are native and individual to each stream and survive there better than any other breeds. Each brook, in essence, creates and evolves its own subspecies of trout, and these red brook salters are the fish the restored brook will support. Ironically, this laborious and to my generation painful process means taking the brook back to where Theodore found it, back to what first caught his fancy in 1865. In October of 1871, Theodore took Mimi and his daughter Cora on a three-year sabbatical to Europe where he could renew connections with leading zoologists interrupted by the war and study collections of the brittle starfish, which were his specialty. This interlude was one of the happiest of his life. His love for his daughter Cora, who shared his tender heart and his sense of humor, deepened. At first, it was all fun, but then the tide of good fortune, which had carried Theodore all his life, turned against him. First Mimi had a miscarriage, and then on July 20th, 1873, their beloved 11-year-old daughter Cora died after a brief and tragic struggle with something like typhus. Mimi and Theodore returned to Boston utterly devastated, and their days turned black. She was buried in Mount Auburn Cemetery in Cambridge, one of the first garden cemeteries in the United States. It was a brilliant autumn day. After the full service, we followed in carriages to that quiet lot that Father bought, number 705 on the ridge of Pilgrim Path. There stood the freestone monument shaded by the elm and the maple. There was a fresh grave lined with brick dug on the left as we faced the lot and in front of the subterranean vault. Mimi wishes a cross with twining flower to be put at the head. Everything shall be as she wishes. But for my child, my heart's core, I wish only to avoid outward show and sacredly hide her in my bosom. She has no public history. Her memory belongs only in the depths of my soul whence she herself has been torn. Oh, God help me, for there is no help and comfort in man. Thirtieth of September, 1873. I went to my cottage at Red Brook, and the next day took a look at the old place. All was unchanged, for nature smiles or frowns on you, regardless of your happiness or misery. Nature holds her even course. There was Red Brook, never still, yet always the same. The stream was examined for its whole length and the trout were found in increased numbers, even to the very salt water where the sea trout were mottled and speckled, but had none of the deep green and vermilion of those in the upper waters, say, New Way Bridge, I endeavor to take an interest in things and begin to succeed, for now my life must be employment, interest, and resignation in place of that intense happiness which once was.
Mimi realized the depth of her husband's despair. Nearing 40 years of age, she determined to risk another pregnancy. The sight of children seems to have sometimes a painful effect on my poor wife, but my heart warms to them because they are pretty and innocent, but they are painful for a father sees nothing but his lost child. God help us. For over 20 years I have written in this journal and now I talk to it in my trouble. Monday, November 23rd, 1874. At 6.15 a.m., Mimi had a little boy, apparently healthy, and she natural and strong. The baby was named Theodore IV. For 10 days, my house that was so lonely has been brightened by the little baby. That current, for the moment, has turned and runs all the other way. Mimi, perfectly well, and abundantly nurses the child. So long as the boy is spared me, I will love him. But I will not build hopes on him, for they are not of this world. March 20, 1876. Cold. Part of the bay skimmed over. Mr. L took seven trout. Tomorrow, we propose to go back to Brookline. Seven pleasant weeks without ills and without cares. A sort of quiet retrospective of all our married life and of memories that are happy. For they rest on the bright days of the few we have loved much, of whom some are gone and some are here. In my college days and early married life, and in the dreadful wartime, the tide of God flows on, bearing us with it. Cora was with me. She was snatched away, and I with her, for it seemed as if nothing was left worth calling a man. But then, when not dreamed of, came this little visitor, and stands in visible form beside her memory, and today I love them just alike, just alike. Gradually, Theodore Lyman left his despair behind and accepted a new life. At 9.30 a.m., Mimi had a second boy. And so, when past 40, Mimi and I, having lived one life together, are beginning another. To me, it all comes with a gentle happiness, for my experience has taught me not to exult, not even to confidently hope, but to take good days, thankfully, each as it comes. March 20, 1879. Mr. Lyman fished from the eye stone to New Way Bridge, took 31 good fish, including a fine sea trout that weighed one and three quarter pounds. Air, 82. Water in the meadow, 70 degrees. My dear wife has had tolerable health, though much tormented with neuralgia in her head. As for me, I have been in the doctor's hands in fighting my writer's palsy, which I have done for the last four months by massage and muscle stretching, by resting the right hand and writing with the left hand, by electricity, galvanic current and statical sparks, and even by cordery along the cervical vertebrae. The treatment gave no improvement, but even a backward tendency. On November 7th, 1883, there happened a great change in my life. I was elected a member of Congress, a most unexpected honor, and one I would fain avoid. Lyman was elected as a reformer, a member of a group called the Mugwumps. The Mugwumps were successful in getting Grover Cleveland elected as president over the corrupt James Blaine in 1884. Redbrook is far from Washington, and fishing trips became infrequent. The boys both well and grown. I got through an important bill to retire enlisted men after 30 years' service. But resistance to his civil service reforms 
and Theodore's increasingly infirm health led to his defeat for a second term. My palsy of the right arm and leg grows gradually, year by year, a little worse. This writing with the right hand is very slow and difficult. Arsenic and spinal douche have not availed. Either way, it is incurable, and I must look forward with resignation to growing infirmity. This last diary entry signals the brutal advance of a mortal neurological disease. Was it Parkinson's? Through the last decade of his life, it grew steadily worse. In the words of a classmate, day by day, parting with power to act, until at last he was forced to stand still and watch the stream of life flow by. A soul imprisoned in a body which was gradually losing all power of movement and which at last became absolutely helpless and dependent for every service upon external aid. He was forced to that silence he once sought at Red Brook. Mimi became his voice and his movement. His boys eventually replaced him in the Brook's logs and as stewards of his Red Brook legacy. April 29th, 1886. Mrs. Lyman and Ted IV aged 12, came from Brookline, the last for the first time, and Mrs. L. after many years. Ted took 18 trout in Mr. Packard's cranberry bog. Mrs. L. took three in the salt meadow, drove to Gibbs Narrows, and also got mayflowers. In his last years, there was time for quiet reflection on the course of his life. He'd always said that he had more than his slice of cake. He used the advantages he was born with for the Union cause during the Bloody War, and afterwards to create a memorial hall to the Harvard dead. He strove to establish science at Harvard University and throughout the country, to build the Museum of Comparative Zoology, to research and preserve fisheries in Massachusetts, to serve in Congress, and to nurture and protect his family. Through all his efforts, runs the quiet current of Red Brook, an idea as much as a thing, studied, cherished, and preserved by three generations of his descendants, through two world wars, through Korea and Vietnam, through industrial and population development unthinkable in 1876. It is a heritage his fellow citizens of New England now nurture and enjoy.